There we go. Hi, my name is Steve Guo, and I'd like to welcome everyone to the Seattle Software Crafter Meetup. Uh, we get together on the fourth Thursday of every month, except for November, December, uh, sometimes in November and December too, where we get to talk about CodeCraft. This is different from other meetups that talk about technology specific things where like JavaScript libraries or new, new technologies that come out. We talk about how to get better at writing code and code craft um, and all sorts of things around that. And that's a pretty big umbrella overall. And we do it because, you know, at least Paige and I, and certainly the company we work for believe in code craft. We believe in doing things the right way and not just pushing code out the door. And we believe that, you know, it's part, you know, the contract of being a code crafter, you're doing continuous learning, you're doing continuous deliberate practice, ways to improve your craft, things like that. You're, you're reaching out to other people, you're helping other people uh, in the community to grow and nurture as well. So there's there's a slight difference with that and something that that we've noticed and Paige and I will talk about it a little um, uh, next month is that when you sit down and you start writing code with uh, an, a fellow crafter or a team of crafters, there's a different magic, a different vibe that happens. So stay tuned for that talk next week that or next week, next month that Paige and I will talk about. Um, but there's, there, there's a bond with, with CodeCraft and it's, it's pretty amazing. I'm seeing Eddie shake his head and I'm seeing Cody shake his head. It's like, when you sit down and you start writing code, it's like, I didn't, it, yeah, we just go hit the ground running. It's fun. And if you ever get a chance and you see me at a conference, uh, sitting on a table, sitting at a table, page at a conference, I'm sure is similar Hit us up. We're happy to write code. I'm personally write Fizzbuzz with me. I'm happy to do that, uh, Mr. Fizzbuzz. So, anyway, to get to this week's talk, there this uh, this month's talk is um, Ted Young, and he's going to talk today about stop obsessing about primitives. Paige, do you want to do a little bit more of the intro since you're the one that invited him? You're muted. I know. I know. No. Um, yeah. So, so you probably, if you know, Ted, you probably know him from as jitter Ted from online, you know, he's, he's been doing what, what lately you've been doing a lot of the, with James Shore, the, um, yeah. testing without mocks type of stuff. Yeah. Pretty yeah. excellent stuff. Yeah. Um, I was lucky enough that in, in all, in of all places, Manchester, England, two weeks ago, I was able to try out, uh, his TDD game, which, it, um, just came out uh, a couple weeks ago, right? Uh, there you uh, go. A couple of months. So months the, the digital version has been around for a year, and I finally got off my butt and got it into physical production. And there's so... a digital version. Awesome. <clears throat> we'll have to. I'll check yeah. that out because that's yeah. yeah. So it's it's a print and play uh, version, but but the the uh, I basically got got over and, and got it manufactured. Yeah. And the one you saw in in Manchester is the first official production copies. Oh yeah. <laughs> It was awesome. It was a great game, and and I mean, we had we had fun, and it brought up a lot of conversation about about TDD and that which I love to hear because that's that's the purpose is, is yeah. bring up that conversation. Yeah, yeah. the the one The one problem, I tried to put this on as a sticker, and it's a magnet, and it almost grazes oh. our drive. And so there you go. No. <laughs> but um. Yeah, you can you can find Ted at at the most awesome URL of ted.dev. Yeah. Yeah, it was really excellent and um would uh, do you have do you have classes or anything like that coming up? I want to just give you a quick Yeah, so <clears throat> besides my TDD game which um you can buy the print and play and print and cut it and do it yourself or if you don't want to spend all that time and effort, uh you can buy the physical version. You go to tddga.me. I put the thing in uh, the link in the in the chat um i'm currently uh in the process of getting through my refactoring uh to hexagonal architecture basically making your code more testable of course uh, it's currently closed for sales but if you go to uh 
if you basically go to mycmt.dev, which stands for make your code more testable.dev and sign up, you'll find out when, when it reopens. Um, I'm also going to be, if anybody's going to be in Kansas City for the Kansas City Developer Conference in June, late June, I will be there speaking, uh, giving two talks. So double, double your jitter, Ted. Awesome. I live there. I will buy you barbecue. I, I will be happy to eat the barbecue. All right. So that's that's kind of all I have. I'm I'm excited to hear hear you talk about primitive obsession, because you know, there, it's it's a it's important. I think it's really yeah. something that a lot of us that I, are feel strongly about. And uh, I yeah, take it away. All right. Go ahead. <clears throat> all right. So um, the title is "Stop Obsessing About Primitives." Although I guess you know a lot of people said, "No, no, obsess about primitives and like fix it," and and that's a great way to think about it. Uh, so I have a warning: um, if you're not familiar with with primitive obsession, um, by the end you may see it everywhere, and you may feel the urge to fix it everywhere. Um, resist that urge; you can't fix everything all the time. Uh, but seeing it everywhere, I'm not going to apologize for. I think uh, <clears throat> one oh. I've been doing Java for for as long as Java's been around. Um, I, I've lost track of it. I think it was just 28 years. Anyway, way too long to think about. And so over the years, I've really done a lot of work and 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 thinking about object oriented programming. I think th this way of looking at well, okay, your classes are too large. This is something I see as as a coach and a trainer. I see lots of systems and I've worked on lots of systems that where the class were just too large, taking the single responsibility principle and saying, oh, this is an account class. Therefore, everything having to do with account goes in there. It's like, yes, but no, that's not quite the way to look at it. And so whenever I encounter classes too big, a lot of the sort of things you think about is like, okay, well, what do I do about it? How do I figure out how to find those seams? How do I figure out how to slice it? And I think that's what what really, um, as I've <clears throat> talked about this, and I teach this this idea uh, in in all of my classes, and it, it's it's one of the sort of if you can have a favorite code smell to to fix, this is it for me. And we'll see. There's actually a flip side of this this code smell. That's another code smell, and they work really well together, or poorly together, depending on how you look at it. <clears throat> so. If your classes are too big, it's often because they have too much detailed state. And so I use this word detailed, meaning there's there's low level code, right? The, the lowest level kind of code you can write. And so the problem with this is it makes the, the code hard to understand and especially test. Um, for me, I am, you know, you can tell because I created a game called T the TDD game. I care a lot about testing. Everything I think about from architecture to design, everything is all about how can I make this easier to test? And bigger classes are harder to test. So the examples I'm gonna use uh, in this session are basically uh, the blackjack card game. Now, <clears throat> you don't have to know the detailed rules. It is surprising how many little nuanced rules there are in this game um, that have to do with state and ordering and uh, all sorts of variations and, and without even getting into all the wagering and betting aspects of, of Blackjack, which are important. Um, so you don't have to know too much other than the, the code is, is basically showing a single player playing against the dealer. So you play against the dealer, your goal is to get to 21, um, as close to 21 without going over, but really your goal is to beat the dealer. Um, but to get there, you, you, if you get 21, then, then you're more likely to, to win. And so I'll, it's a console-based game and the source code is available. And I'll show you sort of what it, just what it looks like. So here we see the dealer, uh, the initial state of the game where we started the game and the cards have been dealt. Um, you only see one of the, the dealer's cards. So there's figuring out, you know, from a state point of view, are we in progress? Do we need to show the dealer's, what's called the dealer's whole card or do we hide it? Uh, and then we have a choice, we can hit or stand. And so I'm gonna stand because I have 20 because uh, the face cards are worth, worth 10. And it turns out that we tied, that's called a push, a push is a domain term. Uh, and so 
we want to see these kinds of names and abstractions in in our in our code. So that's what it looks like. Um, and so let's look at the state. So <clears throat> here we have basically most of the state in this in this main class, which is the game class. So if you came into this code base and you said, okay, let me figure out what is what is this thing? So if you saw this in, in, in a class and in, in this thing, what would you be curious about? So you can type in chat, you can unmute yourself. What would you be curious about or be unsure about in terms of this field? You could be playing go fish according to that. Yeah. <clears throat> What else? What else don't we know? How many are there? Yeah, how many are there? What's it? Where's the top of the deck? What happens when we run out? What are what are its invariants? Right? Cody says, "What is what is its invariants? What are its constraints? What are what are the are they shuffled? What are the operations? What are the default operations? Right? We know it's a list of cards, so we know there's is there a minimum size? Is there a maximum size? What there's, there's all sorts of stuff. And you could, using your wonderful IDE like IntelliJ, find all the usages and find all the code and, and explore and figure it out. Um, but that may be spread throughout 177 lines of code, which granted is not large for most people. For me, it's too large. And again, it's not lines of code. It's is there a lot of code here that is doing things that that is involving just this one piece of state? So all the things around around deck, and we could ask the same questions for these these two things. They look the same as as deck, right? They're a list of card, but certainly they're invariants, they're constraints, they're operations. <clears throat> the questions we might ask about these things are very different but they look exactly the same as they're defined. <clears throat> Gets even worse in some cases with Booleans, right? So with Booleans, we now have a big problem because are these completely independent? Are they related in some way? Could the player be done, but the initial cards not dealt? Uh, no, that makes no sense. But how would you know? Just by looking at these, there's no way to tell that these three Booleans are actually quite closely related. So Sherry asked how, how I define variance. Basically, what is the legal state that this thing could be in? <clears throat> so an invariant is you cannot possibly have player done be true if initial cards dealt has been false, right? You, you have to start the game and deal the cards before you could possibly be done. And so that's an invariant. And in fact, the dealer cannot be done if the player is not done because the dealer always goes last. So these are the invariants. And how would you know what these invariants are? You may not, and you may search through the code. You may also find that they're not explicitly enforced, which can be a problem because yeah, so legal states, the constraints, what are the allowable, what are the valid values for the state? And that defines what the value, what the valid values for, for the object itself. What is the valid state of, the, of this game class? And that's, a, and that's a lot to work with. Even worse from, from, from my standpoint is how do you test this, right? So there's a, a whole bunch of code and how do we test it? How do we test just the code related to deck, right? Because deck has certain features. You create it, you shuffle it, and then you deal it. And how do we know that works? Now, you're not going to test random number generator, but how do we know that when we run out of cards, certain things happen, and, and so on? And for hand, there's going to be a bunch of behavior associated with that that really has nothing to do with the game itself. It has to do with what kinds of questions do we ask those? And so the fact that that they're mixed in with other things is a problem. So 
this code smell is, is basically primitive obsession. And so we have to, to talk about what are they and, and, and where do we find them? Where, where are we gonna look for these things? So say out loud or throw into chat, when you think of primitives, what, what comes to mind for you? Money. Money, all right. I tend to think anything that that is a, is a domain concept that I haven't modeled as a domain concept, right? Okay. That's if you want to, if Tim Odding was Oddinger was here, he'd point you to the seven virtues of code, yep. and he would talk about this being less developed, right? Mm -hmm. Primitive versus being developed. Yep. So Jeff says okay. anything from a library, right? <clears throat> so really, what we're saying is here is the things that that most languages provide out of the box. Right, int, long, float, car, et cetera. Right, these are the, these are the usual suspects. So some examples are ticket quantity. Might store that as an int. An event venue ID, an identifier for some event venue. Might store that as a, as a long. A surcharge percent, because we're talking about tickets in here. So of course there's going to be surcharges. So uh, that's a that's a percent. Right, and so these are these are scalar values, right? Because they can hold their single value, right? You, ticket quantity cannot be two and four at the same time; it's two. Um, Boolean is a special case, right? So I mentioned it before because it's oh, it's incredible how often there is a state machine in hiding that there are these states that that your your object goes through. Now, not all the time, but a lot of it. <laughs> I, I'm always surprised, like when I really think about Boolean, it's like, is Boolean the right representation here? Are these three Booleans together? Like we've got is submitted and then is valid and then is approved and then is completed. And this sounds like some kind of workflow. Can, be, can we be sort of completed, but not valid? Probably not. Mm -hmm. Can we be valid, but not submitted? And then what happens when we say these are false, if is approved is false, does that mean it's not approved or it hasn't gotten to approval yet? And Booleans are, are for me, was just one of the most frustrating things because you need them, but they're so frustrating to, to understand in, in usage. In the game that I just uh, showed you, right? There's initial cards dealt, player done, and dealer done. And these these work together. And we'll see that that this isn't always the, the best way to, to represent these is by themselves sitting raw right in, in your class. Then we get to string. So string is, depending on the language, maybe a built-in construct, but it's it's something that that we take for granted that's again there sort of out of the box. And this can lead to what is always amusingly called uh, stringly type code, where we're doing string comparisons to make decisions. Sometimes that's kind of necessary. So here we have some code from, from the game where it's detecting whether you typed in a letter H or the letter S to indicate whether you, your intent of, I want to hit, draw another card or stand, I'm done. Um, but that's, that's not great. And what if we had username where we were comparing it with a special kind of username, All right? So we had sort of reserved strings like admin and moderator that we were comparing against strings. That would be just awful. Prone to error, all sorts of problems. And so we, we really want to avoid that. Plus lots of these strings have, have constraints and things that we, that we, valid and, and we validate and we, do we want to be validating all the time. Yeah, so booleans, the, the, the tri-state, the infamous tri-state boolean where, where null is one of the states is just, uh, just gives me like shivers. Uh, is null or not a number a primitive? That's, a, that's a, something you might assign to a primitive, but the, prim, the, the primitive that we're talking about here is the holder of, of this information. So, so these three sets, right, and long and so on, boolean and string, those are scalar values. But those really, aren't just the only primitives that I think about. In fact, list, map, set, and, and arrays, if you have to use them, um, these are, all the behavior around these are often, they're just rich in behavior. And for years and years and years, I almost automatically wrapped 
anything that was a collection class, because I'm in Java, um, with a class, right? I wanted to encapsulate it because it had behavior. And these things have, I mean, when was the last time you look at the interface for list how many methods it has? It's pretty rare that you're going to use all of those methods, right? You really are trying to say that there's something special about this usage of this list, this usage of this map. I'm using a map here to store data uh, and associate information because I've got an in-memory you know, repository. I'm faking you know, a database. It's completely different than I've got an in-memory set of lambdas and sort of functions that I'm going to apply based on some information. And yeah, there's, there's a whole bunch of behavior that that if you're going to use, you need to be really careful about. But one of the things we want to do is, is encapsulate this information so we can be clear about what his what is purpose is. And so primitives are sometimes can be a confusing name. So what I, what I talk about are, are basically domain-free types. So domain-free types are basically these types that have nothing specific nothing connected to the to the domain right they're domain free they, you could use them anywhere so money was was mentioned before you could use that anywhere anywhere any hopefully you're using money and not like floats uh, and so those can be used anywhere and this you know you can you can sort of think from a domain driven design standpoint sort of your generic subdomain right although i think it's not quite that but it's the same idea that these are just generic you need them you need to build on them but that's not good enough all right, so those are what we're looking for. Where do we look for them? So instance variables are the, are the primary concern. And so this is where we want to say, look, this username is not just a string, right? There's probably constraints to it. There's probably limitations to it. There might be some things that, that it can't hold. Uh, we want to easily look for unique ones, things like that. Method parameters. Now, so originally, the if you look at sort of the definition that Martin Fowler wrote uh, along with with Kent Beck on on code smells in the refactoring book, didn't really talk about a lot about about sort of method parameters. But one of the things I find is if you see this over and over again with the method parameters being passed in, I automatically think about: Is it valid? Do I know it's the right thing, or do I have to check it again? Yeah, tuples to me are just another collection. Return values as well. And we'll see that, that return values is, it adds this extra code smell that you have to watch out for that, that uh, I'll just name now, but we'll look out for it later, feature envy. Now, local variables, I don't care about. If At some point, you've got to use primitives. You've got to define them. You've got to perhaps extract them. Um, but as long as it's sort of localized, right? What we're talking about is, is, it, is it sort of outside of, of methods and, and, and available, especially to, to others. So what's wrong, right? So we already looked a little bit about it, how if you look at just the fields in, a, in, in our game class, we didn't quite know what all we could do with them. So there's this mixed responsibility. So right now in this game class, there's a lot of, you know, there's code where we have to figure out well, some of this has to do with some of the Booleans. Some of this has to do with the hand, um, the player or dealer hand. Some of this has to do with the deck. And it's all intermingled. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it is all intermingled at the detailed level. And so there's a lot of detail here about this stuff. Um, there's a tremendous amount of detail here that has to do with calculating the value of the hand. And we can sort of lose sight of what is the purpose of this game class. And that is one problem. And so this dispersed logic, sometimes that logic can leak out to multiple classes. And so now you've got multiple classes dealing again with these low level things like, like lists. Yeah, exactly. It's very, very complex. And especially you've got multiple fields working together, right? If you are defining your own money class because you've defined uh, you know the long and the, the the value and the currency yourself um, that's a problem but lots of times we have fields that work together 
we might have a list of players and we might have a pointer to the current player who might have a pointer also to, to something else. And there's, there's, this is all about sort of missing abstractions. And a lot of times it lacks units and range, right? What is the range of this thing? What are the valid values of, of this? But for me, again, most importantly, it's, it's hard to test. How do I test that my deck works? How do I test that the player hand, I can evaluate it? And in fact, how do I test that, that calculating the value of a hand, which is important in blackjack, right? To figure out, did you win? Did you go over? I have to do this awkward way of testing it. So right here, if I want to test, does it properly calculate the value of this hand that is consisting of a card that has a two and a card of rank seven? Why am I going through a game to do that? That's so awkward. I have to create this game and I have to fake dealing the cards, which means I have to fake creating a deck, which means I have to, like, I can do it. And it's all using great test doubles, but boy, is it awkward. Just so I can figure out, is the value nine? And so when you find yourself, and this is where having to do lots of setup in your tests, Yes, we can refactor, and I'm, and I'm a big proponent of refactoring and encapsulating your setup in your tests. But you also have to be careful that you're not hiding a design problem. So we've got this mixed detail behavior where you have a class that handles the details for everything, right? It's like you're running your own restaurant, but you're doing everything. You're seating customers, you're giving them the menus, you're taking their orders, you're giving them the specials, and then you run over and cook and assemble the meals. And, and then you have to go and, and place the orders for more stuff. And then you take the meals and you carry them to the table, you give them their check, you operate the cash register, you take their money, you clean it. Like, oh my gosh, that's so much work to do. Yes, you can do it. And you can even do it very well. But I'm exhausted just talking about it. And so, we'd like to, to, to not overload our brains, right? So I saw um, Jay put seven plus or minus two, but in fact, our cognitive architecture, we can only really effectively manipulate three to four things at a time. And in fact, that's the maximum. If we wanna learn something, which is what we do in software development, we need some room, right? It's, otherwise we're constantly shifting, shifting things around. Yeah, so 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 Cody says sort of money representation, right? And if you're stored in ins, and I actually have have my uh, an application called Kid Money Manager where I actually store the money as as a scaled int. And yeah, you if you forget that the scale was was you know two decimals and you somehow made it three or one uh, or none, <laughs> you've got a big big problem. And so there's all this code here, right? These are just the methods in this class, but a bunch of them have to do with the same thing, list of card, except not all of them are the same thing, right? Just because it's a list of card doesn't mean they're the same thing, right? This list of card here is about the player hand. This list of card here is about the shuffle deck. These list of cards here this is also about the hand. And so again, you can sort of see this, this mixture of, of things. And, if, and again, testing this is, is gonna be hard. And so primitive obsessions, you've got just too many primitives, too many domain-free types, and they're associated detailed behavior that are in a single class. And so I actually have a checklist that I, that I go through to, to evaluate is this suffering from primitive obsession? And so the first item is, is it a domain-free type? Because if it's not a domain-free type, hopefully it's, it's descriptive, right? If I see deck in a class, then I, I know what it is. And I can go look at that class and I can look at the tests against that class and figure out how it operates, what its constraints are. But if it's a domain-free type, whether it's a list of card or an int or a Boolean, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna have to look further. Is it used in behavior logic looping? Is it, in, is it involved in some kind of logic, logic or looping? Because if it's not, if it's just a description of an event, 
not doing anything, just used for display, then maybe I'm not too concerned about it. But, and this is where you start seeing it everywhere. It's like, you start thinking about, well, is there a limit to description? Can it be any length? Can it have any characters in it? Can somebody stuff SQL into it? Then you start saying, well, I guess we do some validation. We, there are some constraints. It can't be too long because we have to display it in a certain place on a ticket that gets printed or, or displayed on a mobile phone. And so a lot of times you think that, oh, this is harmless, but actually maybe maybe there are some constraints. Maybe there is some, some logic that it's in, involved in. Then the question is, is the class doing other things? Because if it's already encapsulated, right? If I have a class and it has one field in it, and all the operations are, are manipulating that field, well, that's great. You've already got a, a class that's nicely encapsulated and cohesive. But if that class is doing a bunch of other things like this game class and it's doing it at that detailed level, you've got primitive obsession. So how do we fix it? Well, we create new types. Look under your chair. Look under your chair. There's a type there. Type, there's lots of types. And types even get types. Types all the way down. <clears throat> lots of types. You want lots of types. More types. UID is, is a domain-free type. So don't use UID. Use something else. I, I'm being facetious because you can type alias in JavaScript. Oh, okay. And you yeah. can just make a UUID as a string, and now yeah. it's not a string anymore. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and and this is, uh, and this, it's, un, I don't know whether it's fortunate or unfortunate. Uh, so in Java, you can have types that are have different names, even though they have the same content. Um, whereas in TypeScript, you, you can't. Uh, and that gives Java, well, there's pluses and minuses to that. Um, now, I've had people say, but we've got 40,000 classes. You want us to create more? And I'm like, OK, this is not your problem. Your problem is, you, why do you have 40,000 classes? You, I hope you're co-generating some of that. Um, that's not the problem we're, we're talking about. Uh, and 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 sometimes I'll, I'll get like, well, isn't that going to be slower and, and so on? And I think that. Uh, there's an overemphasis on performance. Not that performance isn't important. I think I, I, I'm very frustrated because I was trying to, to type some stuff into PowerPoint and there's a lag in typing stuff into the notes in PowerPoint in 2023 on an eight core Intel iMac. Why is there lag? So performance is important, but a lot of times readability is really what we need to, to worry about. Because a lot of our, the, you know, depending on what kind of, if we're going to sort of real-time-ish system, then yes, performance is going to be important, but not every single part of it. Um, and so uh, readability, even if you have to worry about performance, it would be nice to understand what it does before you optimize it. Yeah, and so absolutely you want to measure um, and hopefully you're measuring what the lag time is between you typing something and getting feedback. Uh, hopefully that's being measured somewhere and whoever is doing that at Microsoft is not doing a good job. So when I say many more smaller types, I'm not kidding. Deposit amount, why can't that be its own type? It has an absolutely its own sense of what is valid, certainly is not negative, not in any system I've worked in, probably not zero, although it could be. Maybe that's some kind of special thing that you're interacting with some old system that needed to know that zero meant, oh, it's a new day and we close the books. But most of the time, deposit amount is gonna already have some, some valid range, some valid values and provides meaning. If this were even a money, if you have a method that takes money, 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 how do you know what the difference is between any of those pieces? One might be deposit amount, one might be some other kind of amount, and you need to tell the difference. And God forbid you've got Boolean, 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 Boolean. Then all bets are off in understanding what that does. 
And withdrawal amount is not likely the same constraints as deposit amount. And plus, you can't mix these two up. If they have two different types, you're not going to mix them up. Account balance is likely, you know, maybe it can go negative, maybe it can't. How far negative and, and so on depends. Discount. It may have started out as here's how many dollars off you get. Then it became, oh, you know what? We want to offer a percentage off. Well, now what do you do? And so I've worked on systems that had this exact problem. We were handing around ints everywhere. Maybe we were using big decimal and encapsulated in a money class because it was a, a monetary amount. And then we wanted to change it to, oh, we want to also have discount be a percent off. Well, you could then say, all right, now I'm going to pass in two different things or I'm going to have some logic. Well, now you've got to go all over the place and change this. And so encapsulation is what helps with this, is we, we provide what is the concept here? It's not just money. It is it, a meaningful thing of a discount. And in fact, the discount type might do the work of giving you the result of what is the discounted amount, right? Here's $100, apply the discount. Hey, now it's $75 because it was a 25% off discount. I don't care, right? I don't care. Like I got the discount from somebody. I'm assuming it's correct because it's, it's a valid object. I don't care how you calculate it. Not my problem. And yet the, the, it's clear what it does. And it's also, oh my gosh, so easy to test. How do you test a, a, a class that has one method in it? You write some tests, you test, like it's easy. But imagine it were involved in something like the shopping cart where you have to now, oh, I have to flow stuff into the shopping cart so I can see it. Does it oh my gosh, that's so hard. Testing at a distance is really hard. Email, right? It's not a string. It's a special kind of string. Now, how far you'll validate it in memory is, is a question I won't get into. There's lots of debates and arguments. Um, it may even have a a flag inside of it that says, has it been validated from the fact that I sent an email and got a response back, which is really the only way to validate an email, in my opinion. Username I mentioned, ticket quantity, there's gotta be some, some range. I wanna buy a thousand tickets. No, no, you're not, no, 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 not allowed to. Inventory level, weight, right? Is that domain free or not? Hmm. Still kind of domain free. Like, well, what kind of weight? <laughs> yeah, browser. Even if it stores internally, it's kilograms or tons or pounds. Is it a shipping weight of a big box? So maybe 75 pounds is fine. Or is it the coffee bean weight that I use to, to make sure I'm precisely making a cup of coffee? I'm likely not using a scale that has a 75 pound limit because I want the precision of grams to figure out if I'm making the, the coffee right. Same thing with temperature. There's not just temperature, there's body temperature, there's oven temperature. Do not mix the two up. Yeah, and is it net weight? Is it gross weight? Is it including the pet? Like all these questions that you ask when you see domain-free values are answered if you create a new type. So there are three ways that I have to solve this problem in terms of what kinds of new types to create. One is an enum, right? Works great in, 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 in some specific cases where at coding time, you know what, what, the, what your options are. So for example, playing cards suit or rank right now in, in, this, in this game class, we've got this card class and suit and rank are stored as string. Well, let's go through our checklist. Is this primitive obsession? Well, suit, it's a string, unconstrained domain-free type. Are there constraints to it? Well, sure there are. Is there logic associated? Yeah, there is. Is this class, this card class concerned with other things? Yeah, it's actually concerned with other things. It's sort of the composite of these two things, the suit and rank. So it turns out suit and rank both suffer from primitive obsession. And so creating enums for this 
totally makes sense. And so if we look at what, what it looks like after you create the enums, even though this card class wasn't very big, it got smaller. The logic for calculating the rank value, right? So cards have ranks two, three, four, nine, ten, jack, queen, king, ace. They all have, have values. Um, but now that's become part of the rank itself. And suit has some of its own properties, like do we display it as red or not? And in fact, this this is red is is maybe even not so great because it's for tuning a boolean. Hmm, boolean. What does it mean when it's not red? Is that really good? Eh, that might be primitive obsession right there, right? And so it's it's primitive obsession all the way down. And so you, again, you start seeing it everywhere. Game outcomes, right? Did you win? Did you lose? How did you win or lose? It's a fixed set. Not going to change that much represent it as, as an enum. And in fact, you may combine what the outcome is with, for example, the bet payoff. How much did you win? Well, it's dependent on how you won. If you just won normally, you get double your money back. If you got blackjack, you win two, two and a half times. Don't go to a casino that doesn't pay to three to two. Um, card face, is the card face up or face down? Again, you could use this as a Boolean, right? Is face up. And then false is, well, okay, it must be face down. But isn't it easier to read if you just say up or down, right? Using the language of the domain rather than, and it's such a small thing, like the technical detail of a Boolean. We, we take it so for granted, and yet it makes code harder to read. Um, I've seen code where, where they represent option contract types, and there are two types. There's a put or a call. And I've seen this represented as a Boolean, and I just shake my head because that requires you to know, OK, if it's not a call, it must be a put. Where is that defined? How, how do we know that? So often what happens is when you move to an enum, what used to be dynamically calculated logic, a method like this, goes away because it's just embedded in the enum itself. It becomes a constant property of the six, that its value is six. The queen, that its value is 10. That's not going to change. But instead of running it sort of dynamically every time, and this is not a performance thing, this is just like, and this code is kind of ugly. Uh, it's a little, little, little complex. But it's so much easier if it's just like, well, that's it. A king is 10. Queen is 10. So enums are one possible way to go, and they have and they fit really well for in certain circumstances. Um, but sometimes you need something a bit more flexible, and that's where what we call a value object, right? Many options, uh, and and they're something that might change dy dynamically. Often they're immutable, um, but you basically substitute one one for another. So some examples of this are. US zip code, which looks like a number. It is not a number. We don't do math on it. We don't say, well, 94114 must be right next to 94115. Maybe it is, maybe it doesn't exist because not every zip code is a, not every five digit number is a, is a valid zip code. And the infamous starts with zero. That zero is really important. So it's really just a bunch of digits, right? So that's a constraint on what it can hold but it must be five or possibly five plus four. And sometimes that plus four is optional. And so it has a different sense than, than something that's just a five digit number. Birth date, it's not just a date. There's some constraints on it. First of all, it has meaning. Second of all, it must be in the past unless you're working on a system that's talking about when somebody is due. And so that birth date, although you probably wouldn't call it birth date, you probably call it due date. So most likely birth date has to, has to be in the past. And if you just passed around a date, again, you're constantly saying, is this correct? Is this in the past? Is this, is this what we want? 
And if you're constantly checking that, then you, you already know you, you've got a primitive. I always laugh at vehicle identification number because it's not even a bunch of digits. It actually allows letters. So it's not a number. It's not even looks like a number, but it has lots of really useful information, but it's not a number. It's not, it, it, it's, it has value and it has specific domain meaning. Yes, and only certain letters and only in certain combinations embedded in all that is it's, it's encoded factory and, and other information. And UUID was mentioned before. And so entity identifiers use types for that. They may hold all you know longs internally, but who cares? I don't care that it's a long. That's not actually a concern. I care, is this a user ID or a customer ID or an order ID? And if you type them, you can't mix them up. So uh, Vaughn actually, uh, Vaughn Vernon, who is known for implementing domain-driven design, um, tweeted this the other day. And I'm like, yes, but not enough, right? So I'll, I'll let you read that for a second. So he's absolutely right, right? We don't want an amount and a currency to be stored separately along with a bunch of other amounts and currencies and that amounts and currencies. You wanna store them as higher level concepts, but the money is still a domain free type. What kind of money? Right, it's still a primitive. It's still a domain free type. Uh, so, so Sherry asks about primary keys. What about primary keys? If we're for loading them into memory and we and they're an identifier of some sort, when we're we're representing them, we should represent them as as a type. What kind of primary key is it? So things like wager, if you're if you're betting in blackjack, you might be constrained on what you can bet. It has to be from one to a hundred, right? So we can see that the constraint of this type is much much smaller than the entire range of of an int. And in fact, there might be only certain combinations. Maybe it's it's a number of chips and chips have certain values. And so your wager consists of these chips. Maybe it didn't start out that way, but, but it, it went that way. Uh, if there's time, Jeff, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about uh, object relational mapping, but uh, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure that's, that's much of an issue. There are other date types that are discontinuous. So I was talking about options uh, and their expiration dates are certainly not continuous. And they go from, and, and it also depends on the equity, more highly traded, uh, larger volume ones tend to have more frequent ones, weeklies as they call them. There's some dailies, um, but not all of them are, are valid and they expire. Uh, and so they're no longer valid. So there's an expiration date that is Typically in the future, you probably don't want to hold on to your option until it expires unless you actually want to own the stock or sell it, depending on which side of the trade you're on. So those are value objects. Uh, and the last category, right? So enums, value objects, and then stateful types. These are basically our, our you know, at least in object-oriented land, our good friends, mutable, uh, mutable state. And so here, these are the things that we want that are going to hold state, but we want them to hold just one piece, one meaningful piece of state. So things like the playing card deck, like the blackjack hand. So here, inside of our game class, all the code around this deck uh, Oliver, thank you for, for mentioning uh, J molecules, because yes, uh, that is a, a wonderful library. And there's some other stuff there that, that I still haven't had a chance to play with. And so in terms of, of deck, right, there's, there's a, actually uh, a very mechanical process for translating and extracting this into, into a new class. I'm not gonna go through the process because we don't have, have that time, um, but it's wonderful. You basically extract the delegate and you end up with uh, 
this other code smell. So we now have deck here. But if we look at, at deck, we see something strange. We see, OK, great. So now this owns. It's the owner and encapsulates and hides a lot of the detail of this list of card. But wait, why are we providing a getter for it? This is the first step in the process to refactor it. And what happens is what we do is we say, OK, we now have a getter. And what do we do is we look for usages of this. We say, what are all the usages of it? And we basically drag them over. And so what we're looking at is what's called feature envy. So feature envy is really the flip side of primitive obsession. Every time I solve primitive obsession, I find feature envy. Uh, and every time I solve feature envy, I often, not always, but find some primitive obsession. And so these two things work well together in terms of solving one and solving the other to get really nice isolated types that are rich in behavior. So primitive obsession fixes the problem of not enough types. Feature envy, fixing feature envy makes your class cohesive and has all the related behavior. And so feature envy is, well, we started out in game with these methods, beats, where we take two hands, did one hand beat another, pushes, did they tie, uh, has blackjack, does, does this hand have blackjack? If so, they, that's a special case. Are they busted is the value of the, the hand over 21. And so when you make these queries, and there's a law of Demeter sense to, to some of these, like especially, especially here, um, when you're asking these questions, but you are asking somebody else who actually owns the data, is responsible for that data, you're, you're sort of robbing it from its richness of behavior. That data, right, that value, that's owned by the other object. How many cards they have, that's information that this, this hand should own. And so we fix it by using move method. So what used to be methods inside our, our class, um, we basically uh, turn into query methods. And so I basically talk about two types of methods on classes, commands, things that, that can change state, can change observable state, and queries that are really like questions, asking it for information, asking it for uh, current state of something. So do you have blackjack? I don't care how you figure that out. It's not my concern. That's your concern. Maybe, in fact, you're not storing the value at all. You're storing event sourced series of events, and one of the events was has blackjack. I don't care. I asked you a question, however you answer, right? That's the purpose of encapsulation. That's the purpose to me. The, you know, the top three things I love about OO are encapsulation, encapsulation, encapsulation. Reuse, I could care less about. If it happens, great, right? To me, it's, it's all about working with our cognitive architecture to hide those, those details. And so we use this step to then fix, uh, expose feature envy. And then we go ahead and we fix feature envy. And so we see that now, we have raised the level of abstraction by creating a method called draw. So now deck has this operation, draw. Give me a card, now it changes state. This is one of the sort of the exceptions to the command versus query. Um, but now it's, I don't care how you do it. Did you do a remove? Did you have some pointer into the list? I don't care, right? Coupling, exactly. This, this basically reduces coupling to the details of the implementation. And so we could continue refactoring this, um, getting to the point where we now have a proper deck. Hey, Ted, there was a uh, yeah. question that can you just um, like uh, command mouse wheel just to make that a little bit larger? Sure, I can do that. Let me go here. Or, or do it that way. Hopefully that's better. And so what we end up with is a deck class that has 
not a lot of behavior, but all the behavior necessary to, to create a deck, right? And so we have two different forms, one where we handed the deck, and this is useful for testing. And then what happens is um, this then becomes easy, almost trivial to test. And we can do the same with, with the hand classes, create, extract them to, to uh, their own class, And there's a, a trick to do this in, in IntelliJ where you basically extract one as a delegate and then inline the other. And you get this, this nice using automated refactorings to get to the point where you now have a separate class. So now hand is represented here. And again, we've turned primitive obsession into feature envy. Right? People are, oh my God, people are calling get cards and they're doing things with it. That's horrible. No, that's fine. That's just a stepping stone. And it becomes again, this mechanical process of you find the usages and you just incorporate them. In fact, it's, I won't go through these, these steps, but basically it's five steps and you just repeat them. You gather everything together. You find the, the, the usages you extract delegate, you extract and move, extract and move, extract and move, and then you finally remove, remove the getter and you're done. For collection primitive obsession, it's almost the same thing. You extract delegate, you find usages, you extract and move, extract and move, you can till the, until there's no more usages, and then you clean up and encapsulation and, and so on. And using a, a tool, I, one of the things I love about Java and that keeps in the Java is that we have tools like IntelliJ IDEA that make a lot of these refactorings, uh, these automated refactorings, just wonderful. Um, that's one of the main reasons I'm, I'm still with Java is because the tooling is so great. And you can follow this mechanical process and, it, and you don't have to, what I like about it is you don't have to think, you just say, what are the usages of this thing? Find the usages, go to it. Okay, what does this mean? This is, is busted. You extract it to a method and you move it over, extract, move, extract, move, extract, move, extract, move. And, and it's just mechanical. Then there's a little bit of thought process at the end when you want to think about, okay, do I need to further constrain the data exposure? Um, is there other feature envy? Are there public methods that should be private? Have I now, do I now see maybe other primitive obsession and so on? So what we've done is we've started out with this class that had a bunch of detailed things in it. Right, this list of card that's a deck and it had some methods that were associated with it and some code associated with it. We had some cards and it had some code associated with that. And so we got rid of the deck from and, and gave it a name. We were already calling it deck, but now we've given a name and, and said, here's what you can do with it. You can create it and you can draw cards from it. That's it. We did the same thing with hand, we said, we're gonna make a class out of it and here's the things you can do with it. Here are the questions you can ask and here are the operations you can do. So that's great. We've made games smaller. We've made new things to raise the level of abstraction of our code. But again, if you know me, I'm all about easier to test. I can now test deck easily, isolated. I can test hand easily in isolation. And so if you want your code to be easier to understand test, using primitive obsession to tell you where to find those seams and create more and smaller types can get you uh, code that's easier to understand and test. And that's all I've got for you. Actually, I have a lot more, but that's all I have time for. <laughs> that is awesome. That is awesome. Good stuff. We are a little over time. That's part of the reason why the invite is for this is is longer because I'm sure there's Q and A, uh, lots of questions to be asked about this, and so you know we'll keep on going. If you're good with that, Ted. Absolutely, I am at your disposal. If you got questions, go ahead and ask them. Um, so just a note: uh, if you want to contact me, Ted.dev about has all of the various sensory ways of getting in touch with me. Um, if you sign up uh, with a newsletter um, and you want the source code, 
and and all the steps that that I, sh I showed uh if you sign up i'll uh, i'll announce that as soon as the the video goes live so and ted I, responds I, to his twitter dms too i can tell you ted responds to his twitter dms <laughs> eventually yeah if if twitter doesn't like swallow them i will respond to them it's not the most reliable way because i've had people say hey i sent you a dm it's like i never saw it oh okay <laughs> um yeah. so it's 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 an okay way but but honestly you can just say ted at tedmyoung.com uh, oh okay that that works really well so i i i love the talk uh i love the domain free types uh introduction to a term like that um thankfully uh, I know Paige, Garrick, and I all had an opportunity to take a two-week course from Fred George, his object-oriented boot camp, which was amazing. Changed Absolutely amazing. Yeah. Changed who I am as a developer. Wow. To the core. And Where do you sign up? Well, he only offers it at engagements that he's at. And as a developer going into it, you know, XP developer that had been writing code for at that time, 15, 16 years, yeah. within the first 15 minutes, I was trying to figure out, do I even know how to code? Mm -hmm. um, it ter it, it's wonderful. But it goes into a lot of the things that, Ted, you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And uh, Quinn Gill has a website. And uh, if you look up micro objects and Quinn Gill, uh, that bring up some of, the, some of these concepts, encapsulation, and why I'm talking about this is one of the practices that I did that I started to do for a couple months afterwards is encapsulate everything, wrap all primitives in an object. And that was taking it to the extreme, the absolute extreme. And from there, I was able to walk it back. After I, after I realized, you know, encapsulating all my Booleans in, the, in an object is extreme, there are some cases where it's really good, some cases where it's not. But trying to walk it the other way, I don't think I could have. Yeah. It's interesting cuz cuz there's there's this line where it's like, "Ugh, this has been this has been a domain free type long enough. It's time to introduce and encapsulate it." And when to do that? If you do it early, you may not capture the right abstraction. But if you do it later, then it's like, oh, now I got to refactor all these usages to to use this thing. So uh, I, I agree that that probably doing it earlier is probably better, um, but not too early. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I, I liked what you said earlier about um, just collections. You just immediately kind of jump right in. I think yeah. I, yeah. just doing that recently, I totally agree. Because yeah. usually you want to ask the collection something that is a domain behavior like... Yeah. Uh, you know, get all names that start with F or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it totally makes sense to wrap that, I think, immediately. Yeah, and even if it's an operation like, do you have this name? Like, I, I wanna say, do you have this name, not do you have this string? Yeah. Right? And do you have this name and, you know, is is that name valid? So I'm not gonna even pass in a string, I'm gonna pass in a name, right? And it, it's just, mm -hmm. you know, types all the way down, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to jump back to the Fred George thing. And one of the things that you, you were kind of talking about that, that he had us doing was when you make a new class, just in a comment at the top, right? What the, what's the job of that class? Mm -hmm. And and it, it shouldn't be, it does this and that, or this or whatever. You shouldn't have and or, or in there. You know, if you have an and or an, or you're doing too much in the class. And then if you're writing code, like, is is this the actual job of this class? Is it is the de is the game is the job of the game to actually tell if the hands match? If if the answer is no, you right. have a new class. You can extract that. Right. Um, yeah. And so something that's interesting is my tent my my general way of of coding is I don't create classes like a blank class. I, I almost rarely do that. I'm almost always refactoring from code that exists. And using a technique like this means that process, I don't actually have to think as much about what is the job of this class. If it's accessing this collection, it's probably related to the other code that is accessing that same collection. And you group those things together and you end up 
magically with, hey, look, there's an abstraction here. I wasn't even quite sure maybe of what that abstraction was until I see all these things were accessing the same collection. They were doing different things. Oh, now I know what this is. Or it was already obvious when when you when you extracted yeah. it. And so so to me, the the blank I, I don't suffer from this blank class syndrome, this blank page syndrome, because it's I'm always saying, oh, this has sort of grown too big. Let me start pulling some things out. Oh, look, there's some primitive obsession. Let me start pulling things out. And then to me, that's that's a feels much more organic to to growing in these these concepts because they're already there. And simple as possible, right? Yeah. So you're you're exactly. you're evolving it from outside in and extracting it out. Yeah. Yep. And not over engineering things. Yep. Yeah. What else? Other questions? I thought it was nice, a, a really nice little problem that you chose for it. It's there's enough there to really see your point, and yet not so much that it was difficult to see your point. So, you know, props for choosing a good example. And uh, you took us through it really well. Great job. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, the blackjack game um, I use in in my classes because it's simple enough, but it's also complex enough. There's some subtleties yeah. to it. Uh, and in fact, <clears throat> I run a, a learning ensemble. We we just did a hundred of them. Uh, we just did our sort of our hundredth learning ensemble over the past two plus years, um, continually adding and modifying to to the game. So we made it a web UI. We did multiple players. We added betting. We added some persistence and and all that stuff along the way. And it's it's a it's it's wonderful sort of how how it can sort of grow, and doing things like looking for for primitive session, pulling out classes. Um, and that's that's why I focus so much on sort of the refactoring angle, uh, like like Martin says, design by refactoring. It's it's really like it's it's creation by refactoring uh, is is another way I think about it. I know uh, I've I've been using and hearing more the use of uh, blackjack for simplest design as well, and iterating on. So what's what's the simplest thing you can do, and giving it to a class. Uh, what's the simplest thing you can do to get me a blackjack game in five minutes? Right. Uh, and that's the exercise of what is the simplest, easiest thing that you can do. It's like you need to deal out three cards. Would be would be the bare bones. It's not a complete blackjack game by any means, but you can run a game of blackjack with just three cards. Mm -hmm. And that's the exercise of cutting it smaller yeah. and then iterating and adding right. the rules, right. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's, that's that difficult design sense. Like, you know, G plus says, you know, many more, much smaller steps take, how can I slice this smaller? Okay. It's not the full game of blackjack. Let's say we'll implement the rules as humans. What do we need to see if we wanted to play remotely? Mm -hmm. well, we need to see some cards. Well, how do, and then we need to get the next card. Right, but hey, maybe we can just see the cards, and we can decide what the next card is. We don't even need a deck. We'll just type in what the, and and it's that constant sort of. Can I make it smaller? Can I make it smaller? Can I make it smaller? Um, and that's hard because you you know you're trying to do that at the same time you're trying to do all this other stuff and 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 at the same time trying to trying to make it as small as possible, um, and that's I think one of the, the best things that I've ever focused on is making smaller steps. Yep. Well, again, it goes back to the concept you mentioned very early on. How many things can the human brain keep exactly. track of? Yep. And if you're trying to think of everything about blackjack all the way down to one-eyed jacks or a jack of spades and, you know, suit specific things, wait a minute, that my head just exploded. I know there was a question about, or maybe more of a comment about um, having these now objects and having to interface with maybe a backend, a REST API, a database, a web UI. Hmm. Um, can you maybe provide some, I know there was a link to framework. Is there any other like cool tips? So, um, so my preference is uh so i like a hexagonal like architecture and i say hexagonal like because hexagonal is not a specification it's what alistair wrote up in 2005 and people interpret it differently 
Um, but the fundamental thing is, is I, I, I like a clear separation between my domain and all this richness. Um, and then how I store it, how it gets sent out, that's a concern of, of something I put in, in what's called an adapter class. Its job is to translate the domain into what is the most convenient form to store in, in this way. And if it's, if it's a one-to-one -one copy that happens, but I'm not always like, I'm a little suspicious if it's truly one-to-one, -one. it's like, then do I really have a rich enough object like, do I have enough types? Do I have, is, is that rich enough? Is the behavior belong and, and are the, is it cohesive? Because if it's a one-to-one -one copy and I'm just copying objects, then that might seem sort of, sort of boilerplate. Sometimes that happens, but uh, I feel better when, when I'm basically just, you know, storing, storing uh, the data um, in, in a way that's, that doesn't look a hundred percent like what it looks like sort of in memory. Um, and there are a bunch of other patterns, and, and I talk about this actually in my hexagonal architecture course. Uh, and there's a the snapshot pattern where basically you just you don't worry about the object at all. You just pull out the data, um, and then just just store that. Um, but it's really from an architecture point of view, it's really the adapter's job to to do that translation of how do I represent this in this other system because. If I'm persisting it, that's to me like a special case. You you don't want to lose any information, right? You don't want to translate things in a weird way. It has to be persisting uh, and the fidelity has to be high. But if I'm sending off, like I want to send an email to somebody, well, I'm not going to send all the information I have about you from your user profile or from your account. I'm going to pick and choose what I need depending on, on the situation. And that translation is going to happen uh, in, in, in that class. Yeah, I like that example. And I've, I've had this experience too, doing a very similar type of architecture where like, you know, you, you're you showing right now a command line tool uh, or game, and then you said you moved it to web app yep. and you, I'm assuming you were able to use the same exact domain yes. logic yes. and you're just adapting it to do di two different interfaces, the yep. command line and, yep. and a browser. Yep. yep. And if you wanted a remote and you, because you like to play using curl, you could do that too. Yep. And it's yep. all the same domain because the domain um, so something I didn't mention because it was sort of not quite on topic, but basically in the domain, it has to be IO free. So I use the term IO free for stuff that if it's in my domain, not only does it touch IO, it has, the, you never find anything that sort of means IO. Um, and that makes sure you're really focused on, on just the domain. Uh, just to share another story related to that, the, one of the experiences I had was we had basically a REST server. We had some business logic there and we had, um, we had some code we needed to run like with a cron tab and we're like, well, we could just hit the, we could hit the server, but you know, the, um, the actual, um, hardware we were using wasn't that great for it. And we're like, it would be really nice if we could have just ran this in a serverless environment. Wait a second. We have a, you know, we've got architecture where I can just take that code and put it in a Lambda done. Right. Uh, did that in maybe 20 minutes. And now yep. we had something that was, yeah, the magic could not be done. Right. Um, unless we uh, extracted the business logic into yep. a rich domain and yep. extracted it away. And kept the, the cron stuff separate, right? Even date and time and all that kind of stuff, that's IO. Yep. It may not seem like IO, but like who gets to decide that five minutes went by or five hours went by or it's 3 a.m. and we need to do that? that that's not a domain concern. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. we may have domain like, hey, we want to run this nightly, but that's not the, the domain concern. That's really uh, the external world's concern. It's an, it's an implementation detail, right? Yeah. And we, we, we want the freedom to allow implementation to vary without having to change it any more than that implementation. Yep. You know, there's one thing you, you brought up that, you know, anytime you're using a list array container you know, of some sort, you automatically wrap it. There's another thing that I've discovered over time that is whenever I'm implementing something new for a project, I wrap it. And that's date time. And it's absolutely no question. It's like, nope, date time is only going to be a custom object within my domain. Yep. And you don't get to use that primitive. Yep. yep. Yeah, because it's- Very easy to mess up. It's, it's, it's <laughs> you know, and for, for me, it's, it's, you know, again, it's like a lot of this is, is great from, you know, replacing implementations or optionality. But again, for me, the, the primary thing is how testable is it? 
how testable yep. is is this code? And if if I have to deal with I/O or I have to sort of fake I/O, that like I can do it, but maybe I can avoid it altogether, and then that makes it easier. Well, another nice thing about leaning into this, like you know, when, when it comes to craft, we, we're constantly talking about how to reveal intention, right? Yes. And and we've got all this obscured intent. Um, if if we're using primitives, we have all this obscured intent, mm -hmm. and and it just makes it so much easier to understand. And and you know, even you you can't get away from the fact that there are associations among concepts. But if you avoid conflicting all their behavior together, you yeah. can look at it and have something tight and clean that's easy to reason that clearly reveals its intention, right? And it's just so it's it's so much easier. And, and now, like Mike, but how many how many times do we have to worry about the intention? Like in everything, you know, everything. the business comes in and they say, oh, oh, what does that do? And like, uh, I don't know. Give me a few hours. Let me uh, let me figure it out. You know, right. oh, there's right. there's a defect. What's wrong with it? Uh, I don't know. Give me a few hours. Hey, can we can we change that to I don't know. Give me a few. Everything we do starts with you got to have this damn to go. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But exactly. Like making the code right, making it more understandable and easy to test. These are these are not quite two sides of the same coin because I can make stuff that's easy to understand, but maybe not easy to test. Although I'd have to probably work at it. Um, and I can certainly make stuff that's easy to test, but maybe not that hard, uh, maybe not that easy to understand. I can use a lot of, you know, really horrible words, um, but absolutely focusing on understandability, right? I, I think it was mentioned somewhere either maybe during before the talk, like we spend most of our time reading code, yep. maintaining code. We may not like to think about that, but that's that's what we do. We, you know, go ahead and measure how much time you're spending actually writing new code. Even, yeah. you know, especially when you're refactoring, you're munging code, but it's it's the code that's already there, and you have to understand it before you can you can start refactoring it. A vast majority of the cost of code is reading, is developers understanding it. Yeah, and it's a, and it's a constant iterative incremental. You're every time you look at something, you you know you may not have looked at it for a while, and you come back to it. I, I experience this all the time, um, and it's like, oh, that wasn't as understandable as I thought it was. Well, let's let's take it the next step and and change it this way. I have a question for you. So, if you're doing outside in, and as a lot of the time I'm doing and you're letting these objects emerge and you're doing TDD, right? Mm -hmm. So you're, you ha end up with, for lack of a better term, these integration tests for these classes that you're extracting out because you're not testing them. When you extract the class out, you have behavior inside the class you're extracting from, but the new class doesn't have any direct tests for it. Right. Do you go and backfill tests? Do you just leave class class level integration tests? What do you do? So I'm just going to define some terminology here because I don't use unit and integration as definitions for tests because I don't find them to be. I find them to be have so much baggage that they've for me they've, they've left out the usefulness. Um, sure. So I think of sort of two axes of I/O free or I/O based. So that gets to the, is this touching IO or is this sort of not touching IO at all? Then there's the axis of, of you know, from Jay Field, sort of sociable or, or, or not sociable tests. And so really here, what we've got is we've got the test. So for example, this hand value waste test, what is it doing? It's testing to see if I have a, a hand of a two and a seven, does it add up to two plus seven? Mm -hmm. If I have a hand that's an ace and a nine, well, the ace there needs to be counted as 11. So that better add up to 20. But it's going through the game, right? Because that was where that code lived. But I refactored it out. Mm -hmm. So what do I do? I mean, this test still works, but now it's a sociable test. Because yep. now game is actually leveraging hand to do all the, the work of, of calculating stuff. Well, I have to do the work of what I call retargeting the test. So I'm retargeting. I'm saying the game is just a middleman. I, mm -hmm. I don't need it anymore. It's just actually getting in the way. Um, and so instead, what I what I can do is I can basically say, take this test and say, hand has this capability. I can call hand.value on it. Um, and so it's a little bit of work, but if your test is, and this is where I, I talk about sort of encapsulated setup. If the setup part of your test is 
well factored. And I've over the past like six months to a year, I've been really focused on like we used to say, so, uh, it used to be more comfortable, more duplication in our tests. And I'm no longer comfortable with that. I really believe at least for setup, it is really valuable to refactor those setup uh, calls. Because then if you change something significantly, like, hey, I'm no longer creating game, I'm creating hand, I only have one method to change. And I've learned this recently because we recently made a change where we had to go and change 75 tests. And that was not fun. And if it was better encapsulated setup, we would have only had to change a couple of a couple of places. And so retargeting of those tests, because right, we extracted out this class and now I can say, oh, I don't need the middleman, I can test directly against that. It's still the same functionality. It's still got a two and a seven and it's still better add up to nine. But this is a mechanical change and then basically just uh, going through them. And it's, it's fairly easy if, as long as the, the, the tests have good encapsulated setup. I have kind of run through the similar kind of question and came down on like there's there's an axis where if you've got extremely solitary tests you end up with code that can be difficult to refactor because you've nailed down the specifics so hard whereas if you have extremely sociable tests you end up with this multiplication of your sociable test has to test so many combination of inputs Whereas the more solitary tests you have, you get, instead of multiplying the number of tests you have to have for your different in inputs, you add up the number of tests you have to have. And I don't know that I like came up with a rule from this, aside from trying to find what is the useful balance, and that is judgment, <laughs> unfortunately. Yes. Yeah. So, so it's interesting because often my, these smaller classes come out of larger classes. And when they come out, I'm also thinking about, well, what are all the invariants that I need to enforce? Like you can't uh, hit a, and get a new card in Blackjack unless you've been dealt your cards. And so there's, there's some, some of that. And it turns out if you want to add betting, you have to have betting first before you can even get the cards dealt. And so these things, but um, change some, some of the things as you, as you pull them out. I don't, Maybe it's maybe it's because my judgment is is good enough that I don't encounter the problem of testing small classes so precisely that it makes it hard to refactor. I just don't experience that, um, and so it could be that it, that it's just good experience. But I find that that refactoring out these things, there's already that that it, the code works right. Because this game was playable from from day one, even though it was all most of it thrown into to the game class and pulled things out. And now I've got, got more pieces that now I can think about, well, what does it mean for hand? I can start asking questions of, does it make sense to ask um, if one hand beats another, if it's busted? Ooh, no, that's not good. Your hand has 22 and mine has 21, you win? No, 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 no that's not the way it works. You're busted, you lost. Um, and so these things sometimes come out and then I'll write tests for that. And, and once I've done that, I generally don't find myself saying, oh, wow, I wish I hadn't constrained it in that way. Um, so I, I, I just, I don't experience the, the, the problem that, that you described, but again, it could be because I've built judgment over the past number of decades. So I do need to run. I can leave this going if there's more conversation that needs to happen, but I do need to run. Uh, Ted? I'm happy, I'm happy to hang out if people mm -hmm. are, uh, yeah. I'll hang out until okay. people leave. <laughs> awesome. Ted, thank you very much for coming and talking. Thanks, uh, as, as usual, awesome talk. Um, I'd like everyone to remember uh, fourth Thursday of June, Paige and I are going to be talking about um, coding with other crafters and how, how, it, how it can be different uh, and amazing and awesome. And with that, uh, Thank you all for coming. Ted, I will, I believe you're still a co-host. I'll stop the yeah. recording here.